Hello, my name is Chief Gordon Planis from South, located in Souk, British Columbia. I would like to welcome everyone to the Rising Economy Week. One word comes to mind and that's not so much, together as one. And that's what it's all about. We are going to do this together. In the last eight months, COVID has had a profound effect on all of us. Now we, we are going to work together to turn that around. We're going to work together to find those partnerships, find the work that helps the ones that need it the most, and also look at those ones that are at home having a hard time. That's why we're doing this work. We also got to consider the next seven generations. We got to think about our babies. We got to think about our children and our children not born yet. So I welcome you all and look forward to the next few days. Aishka, Aishka Siam. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Rising Economy Week. I'm Mark Lovick, Regional Vice President, RBC for South Vancouver Island. As a presenting sponsor for Rising Economy Week, RBC is pleased to support this exciting, proactive step toward a brighter, more resilient economic future for Greater Victoria and Southern Vancouver Island. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown us our region is vulnerable. It has also shown us the outstanding strength our people, business, and, and organizations display. This week, from November 16th to 20th, we've come together at a defining time for our communities to share our challenges and our ideas. Being part of Rising Economy Week aligns perfectly with RBC's purpose of helping clients thrive and communities prosper. Together, we will build back better. On behalf of RBC, please enjoy the fascinating panels and keynotes for Rising Economy Week. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Carrie Slavens. And I'm Dallas Gislason. And we're here to welcome you to Rising Economy Week, an entire week jam-packed with virtual events featuring leading thinkers, disruptive ideas, trend insights, economic outlooks, and much more. And it's all focused on one vital goal, coming together to collaborate on how to move the needle on economic recovery for Greater Victoria and the larger Pacific Northwest region. But before we begin, we want to acknowledge that the land on which we gather is within the traditional territories of the Lekwungen and Wasonic people, on whose lands we live, learn, and do our work. COVID-19 has changed our lives, businesses, and our entire world. Change is happening fast, and adapting is critical to our economic survival. So we need to not only build our economy back better, uh, but in ways that make us more resilient and more equipped to withstand future shocks. And that's what Rising Economy Week is all about. So for Rising Economy Week, South Island Prosperity Partnership and its co-host, Pacific Northwest Economic Region, have curated an exciting lineup of some of our leading thinkers on the economy and on urban development, leadership, technology and more. One of this week's exciting keynotes is John Stackhouse, Senior Vice President of RBC. John is former Editor-in-Chief of the Globe and Mail and author of several bestsellers, including Timbit Nation. Uh, his new book, Planet Canada, looks at the way Canada's 3 million expatriates may be our country's greatest untapped resource. For his keynote this afternoon, John will talk about the skills revolution uh, and why our future depends on it. Rising Economy Week also features CIBC Chief Economist Avery Shenfield's deep dive into economic megatrends for 2021 and beyond. And Miles Drucker is going to present on black swans preparing for the unpreparable about rare unpredictable events like the pandemic we're experiencing. We're also going to hear from best-selling author Dan Pontefract on leadership during a pandemic, Carol Ann Hilton of the Indigenomics Institute on the Indigenous Economy, Monique LaRue, Chair of the Industry Strategy Council of Canada on Canada's Comeback, uh, and Tim Moonen of the Business of Cities, who's beaming in all the way from the UK to talk about Greater Victoria, which he knows well, having worked here, uh, and its path to success and resilience after COVID-19. Plus, there's a variety of fascinating panels, roundtables focused on everything from the She session, how COVID-19 is killing gender diversity, uh, to the digital tsunami, is it too late to future-proof our economy? It's all coming up at Rising Economy Week, and you can see the full schedule by visiting OurRisingEconomy.com. Next, we're going to talk to the CEO who led her organization to act fast and decisively at the onset of the pandemic to address economic recovery for her region. 
Emily de Rosenroll is CEO of South Island Prosperity Partnership, or SIP as it's known, an alliance of over 70 public and private partners in Greater Victoria, including local governments, First Nations, post-secondaries, industry associations, NGOs, chambers of commerce, and major employers. SIP works to boost our region's economic and social prosperity so more families can afford to live, work, and build lives in the region. Good morning, Emily. Good morning. So Emily, we understand that there is a very big announcement uh, coming out today regarding the work of the Rising Economy Task Force, and we want to know uh, what's going on. Tell us about it. Well, we're extremely excited today is the day that we are um, releasing our reboot strategy. That's the Rising Economy Plan. And it's really the culmination of a lot of hard work. There's over 120 stakeholders, all united behind a common vision of a speedy and sustainable economic recovery as we emerge from this economic crisis that has been onset by the pandemic. The Rising Economy Task Force is a group of over 40 individuals that got together in April in response to the pandemic. And we wanted to know what can we do about this? You know, How exposed are we to some of the sectors like tourism and recreation that have been most devastated by the lockdown measures and who in our community are most impacted or most vulnerable um, during these sort of lockdown measures. So the, the task force um, also worked with 10 committees from different sector groups and they came up with uh, many recommendations, over 50 recommendations um, under 10 recovery pillars like investing in innovation, supporting local, preserving our urban uh, vitality and safety and a number of other pillars. And essentially, we're able to, to put that forward today and you're gonna be able to take a look um, and really sort of dive into some of the different themes that are coming up across the sectors. Great, and what has the pandemic shown us about our economy? Well, Carrie, the pandemic has shown us that the economy isn't just out there, so to speak. It's really about people and living within the constraints of our environment. So we've learned that we have to take an active role in shaping the kind of economy that we want. And it's the kind of economy that's going to take care of all of us in the future, take care of our kids and our kids' kids. So really this means, what does it mean? It means investing in each other, the people and businesses, students, education, all of these things that are so critical to keep us sustainable in the long run. So if the report is about building uh, a more resilient future in our region, how do we go about building resilience into our economy? That's a great question. And, and, you know, I think we've been asking ourselves that same question and, and asking ourselves, you know, is returning to normal good enough? You know, or was the pandemic a warning sign that we need to be thinking about our resilience so that in, our in the future we'll be able to better withstand these sorts of big shocks to our economy from global banking crises uh, to pandemics and other black swan events, which could be related to climate change or cybersecurity or a number of other topics. So the Rising Economy Week actually picks up on a number of these themes um, that came out of our report. Um, some of those are things like invest in inclusion. So tomorrow we have a panel on the She Session, how COVID is killing gender parity. Um, and that's a topic that is of critical importance. We're really seeing uh, one in three Canadian women are considering taking a step out of their careers because of the pressures created by the pandemic. We also have another topic, uh, the indigenous, uh, indigenomics topic, Carolyn Hilton uh, doing a really great keynote, an important keynote on how do we make sure that we are having enough um, economic reconciliation occur with the Indigenous community as we go into our recovery. That's great. And, you know, for the conference, obviously there's going to be a lot of issues addressed. Um, but one of them that I think will be an underlying theme is the tale of two economies, which I've often heard you talk about. What do you mean by the tale of two economies? Well, the tale of two economies is, is really about, you know, there are two stories that are occurring right now. Um, there are the sectors and population groups who are doing quite well. And then there is um, a, a lot of sectors and population groups and geographies and so on that are just not doing very well. Um, so what we found throughout uh, as a theme again and again and again, is that we really need to make sure that we're telling the whole story. And so Sure, there might be some really nice stories about resilience and recovery. There's also other stories about sectors that are not rebounding and, and, and people that are getting worse impacted by this pandemic than others. And we did some research um, uh, a while ago and, and found that, you know, pandemics typically cause more inequity. And so this is, again, another opportunity with this current pandemic, as it has been in the other pandemics, 
you know, another situation where we're seeing there's a risk to lose, um, to, to create and exacerbate some of these inequities that already exist. And that actually ties to a lot of other themes that we're pulling out of the report. Um, so things like another pillar is invest in tomorrow's workforce. So later today, we're gonna to be hearing from John Stackhouse, the Globe and Mail former editor-in-chief, um, and now with, the, um, R with RBC, John Stackhouse, all about the skills revolution and how our future depends on it. And we're also on Friday afternoon gonna have all three university presidents from the South Island join us and talk about the future of higher education and how we're able to rise to disruption. Another theme that we're, we're thinking is very important is the digital infrastructure. And how do we make sure there's enough access to be able to close the divide? Uh, that's a topic that we're gonna look at in a, in a number of different panels, one of those being on Tuesday morning, a panel called the Digital Tsunami. And we're gonna explore the question of whether it's not too late uh, to future-proof our economy. In a few minutes, we're gonna to talk to an organization called the Pacific Northwest Economic Region. And as people have been seeing, we're actually, uh, we have a collaborative alliance with this organization between uh, them and us. Tell us a bit wh uh, about why you think it's such an important relationship um, for our region. Yeah, absolutely. I think what's really critical here is that Greater Victoria is part of this regional economy. We're part of the Cascadia region. The Cascadia Innovation Corridor isn't, uh, isn't just a linear corridor, it's a mega region and Greater Victoria is an important part of this mega region. So we, we found through this pandemic, of course, that, that there's no doubt in our minds about how important the, the border is to our livelihoods and to the sustainability of our economy. So we, we found that, I mean, our employment rate in, in Greater Victoria uh, a year ago was, was the lowest in the country and today it's tripled um, whereas you see the rest of British Columbia having just doubled its unemployment rate. So Greater Victoria is extremely exposed and already part of this Cascadia mega region. Now we need to talk about how are we um, maintaining and preserving this high quality of life we have while also acknowledging that we are very much integrated into the Cascadia um, economy. So that's a topic that I'm very excited to, um, to be able to um, unpack some more. We're going to have a session with the ambassador of the United States um, to the United States, uh, Kirsten Hillman, and the U.S. Acting Ambassador to Canada, Chargé d'Affaires, Catherine Brecker. And we're going to be exploring border issues, supply chain, and trade, and members of the industry are going to have two to three minutes to ask their questions uh, to those senior officials, and very much looking forward to that. Great. Well, we're all looking forward to Rising Economy Week. It's going to be a fabulous conference, and uh, it seems to be growing by the moment. Um, and we're expecting people from our region here in Greater Victoria, uh, over on the mainland, throughout Canada, and into the United States. And we'll be talking about our rising economy and how we move into the future. Thank you so much, Emily. Thank you. Next, I'd like to introduce Matt Morrison. Matt is CEO of the Pacific Northwest Economic Region, or PINWARE, which is co-hosting Rising Economy Week in collaboration with South Island Prosperity Partnership. And for those looking at this week's schedule, you'll notice a Pacific Northwest track in blue on the calendar. These events look at issues affecting the entire Pacific Northwest region, such as cross-border health issues, the rise of Zoom towns, restarting tourism, and more. Matt, please tell us a little more about the Pacific Northwest Economic Region, or PINWARE, as you call it. Thank you, Carrie. We are so proud and excited to be hosting this with you uh, next week. Um, PINWARE is a unique organization, the only one we know of in the world, that's cross-border. It's a statutory nonprofit created by five states, three provinces, two territories in the Pacific Northwest and uh, it's existed for 30 years. So uh, if we were a country, we'd be the 12th largest economy in the world as a unit. And we have, I think, the best environment in the world and one of the greatest places to live and the most innovative people. So it's really been a joy for me working the cross-border issues between our states and provinces. And we're so excited about next week. Um, I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about why your organization felt it was important to collaborate on something like Rising Economy Week with uh, us here at the South Island uh, Prosperity Partnership. Well, uh, we have had a partnership 
uh, for a few years and uh, we do every six months a summit and we had planned to have our winter economic leadership forum this very week in Victoria. So it was a natural to partner with you on Rising Economy Week. And uh, Penware has 18 working groups in all of the major um, key sectors in the regional economy. And we work in a public private manner to look at solutions. So uh, the, the whole theme of Economy Rising is perfect for us. We are all about looking at how we recover stronger, smarter, more resilient as we come out of this, hopefully, pandemic soon. Great. Well, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you the next question. The U.S. has just gone through a federal election. So what does the country and, the or and an organization like Pinware need to think about right now to get the economy back on track? Yeah, great question. The, f the first thing that's on everyone's mind is how do we restore the last four years of the Canada-U.S. relationship? We have a lot of work to do, and that's one of our number one goals in all of our working groups is, is to be looking at what should we recommend to the Biden administration? Because our economy, I always say the the economic watersheds flow north and south. And uh, we are so absolutely joined together as two countries that we need to really invest in the relationships that we share. And it's re really vitally important now during COVID that we nurture those relationships and that we look at learning from each other, best practices on healthy recovery. Uh, I want to narrow our conversation down a little bit to uh, something we all know as the as the Cascadia region. So from your point of view, working on both sides of the border, um, how is the Cascadia region doing economically? And what do you think are some of the bright spots and maybe some of the areas that are uh, recovering a little bit slower from uh, from the pandemic? Yeah, great question. Well, certainly the region's doing well uh, relative to other regions. We have the biggest cloud service companies in the world right in our backyard. They're doing fantastic. But in terms of equities, looking at the entire region, uh, obviously the travel industry, the you know Boeing and the entire airline industry is in the tank. Our airports are really struggling. Um, our tourism uh, communities that depend on, especially on summer tourism, are devastating. So we need to work on how we health, our health issues, how we safely begin to ease restrictions uh, for travel. And so we are working very diligently to try to develop health preclearance systems so that we know even after the vaccine comes, we're going to have to have a way to show that I've been vaccinated or whatever. And there's a, a lot of complications to that. So the innovation and the, the high tech workforce that we share really is coming to bear on those issues. And that's, it's vitally important. Well, fingers crossed for that vaccine. And Matt, thank you so much for joining us today. We're really looking forward to all of the panels for the Pacific Northwest track of Rising Economy Week. and. Um, Thank you for your time and please enjoy your day. Enjoy the conference. Thank you so much. Right now, I'd like to introduce you to Mary Rowe, President and CEO of the Canadian Urban Institute. Mary's going to be talking this afternoon about bringing back Main Street as her keynote presentation. She is a leading urban advocate and civil society leader who has worked in cities across Canada and the USA she comes to the Canadian Urban Institute, having served as Executive VP of Municipal Art Society of New York, one of America's oldest civic advocacy organizations. She's also worked with US-based Blue Moon Fund, led, uh, which led um, uh, support for New Orleans in rebuilding after Hurricane Katrina. And she's been a contributor to the national and international city programs through the UN 
Habitat program, and we're fortunate to feature her at Rising Economy Week. Welcome, Mary. Glad to be here. I'm speaking to you from the, uh, the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Chippewa, the Anishinaabek, and the Wendat peoples. And uh, I'm standing at the corner of Queen and Broadview, which is in downtown Toronto. You can see behind me lots of activity here, people wearing masks and walking at social distances, lots of transit. It's a very bustling corner. I appreciate that I'm en route. So this is where you found me, in the city. We love your we love your Zoom background, and we love visiting Toronto. Um, Mary, you've been part of many revitalization projects over the years, and right now, some of our city and town centers are suffering as people work from home, eat out less, shop less, and protect their health more. What are some of the lessons you've learned that may help us in our recovery? You know that Joni Mitchell tune that we're all humming, you know, you, you don't always know what you got till it's gone. I think that what we're realizing is that we really need our local main streets and neighborhoods to be vibrant. You know, I'm, I'm standing uh, two blocks from my house, a block from my house, and I can walk out my back door. I'm on a laneway and I can walk out my back door or the front door onto a main street. And I can, within three or four blocks, find everything I need. And I've got to tell you that during the pandemic, as we've been constrained and not been able to travel as far, it's really brought home to me how important it is to have the services and the amenities, but also parks and all the different things that make urban life worth living are, can be found on your main street. And, you know, we can all sit at our terminals and order things online and get used to having uh, warehouses bring us stuff. Or we can remember that these are small businesses. They may be franchises, which is fine, but they're locally owned. And that by us actually coming and taking our eyes to the street and our money to the street, we're really contributing to the vibrancy and the public safety of our urban communities. You'll notice there's a gazillion people around me here, so I am very, very safe here. Um, it's a very, it's, it's an environment that's convivial and vibrant and diverse, and this is what urban life is about, and I think that a lot of these small businesses are significantly challenged at the moment, and we've got to find safe ways to get ourselves back onto Main Street, and I think there are ways to do it. Well, so Mary, you have a national perspective in your, in your role as head of the Canadian Urban Institute. And I wonder if you can tell us a little bit of what we're seeing uh, from coast to coast uh, in Canada's main streets. We started this thing called Bring Back Main Street, and we probably should have called it Bring Forward Main Street because, you know, there were challenges to main streets before COVID. And like so many situations in urban life, they've been accelerated and made more challenging through COVID. And so now we've got this opportunity, this big collective pause where we have to fix things. And one of the things that we're seeing, and that's true of Edmonton, Saskatoon, Winnipeg, uh, Halifax, I'm going to see how well I can list off Canadian cities. You know, every city is experiencing its own ex uh, challenges around transit, for instance, and that's affecting travel downtown. Lots of office buildings aren't open, um, lots of challenging as people work from home. So what we need to think about and what's going on across the country is people getting really imaginative about how to improve the things that are very close to where they are, adjacent things. So that might mean co-working spaces are going to come to main streets. It might mean that you're only going to go town, town one or, once or twice a week. You're not going to go as frequently. Or maybe you're going to have different kinds of patterns um, of, of how you actually make use transit and get around. So we're seeing a lot of experimentation. And we're seeing, as you know, enormous innovation in terms of places like this, restaurants, that are finding new ways to pivot and offer takeout safely. Where we've seen a wonderful transformation of streets, as I'm sure you have where you are, and um, where streets have been repurposed to be patios. I'm so sorry about my little patio that's in a coffee shop near me. They're going to have to pull it off because of snow removal. Darn. But uh, I think these are lessons that we don't want to ever forget. We want it same with, you know, when you go pick up a pizza, now you can get a bottle of wine. These are all, that's the trivial example. But I think there are lots of things that we need to be really uh, extra vigilant about. The other thing is that we've got many, many parts of cities across the country that don't have these amenities. They don't have the investments in their main streets that they could have had. And I think we, those of us involved in urbanism and city building, have to really look at how do we rebalance that. So if you've got communities where there are lots and lots of high-rise towers and, they, and the planners, you know, or the city kind of forgot to put the other amenities in, now we have to be really intentional about getting investments for parks, for open space, green space, commercial spaces, community spaces, uh, you know, enhancing our libraries, enhancing our different kinds of shared services. We have to get very intentional about how that gets distributed across different neighborhoods where we live, uh, because you're not going to be able to bring everybody into one location anymore. Uh, and I think that's a really important learning. I think that's a really important, uh, 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 in profound change in the way urban life and cities are going to organize themselves.
Do you see changes happening um, in the built environment, for instance? Will cities of the future require wider sidewalks? Will they require wider hallways? Um, what are you seeing there? You got hips like me, you need wider sidewalks and wider, <laughs> and wider hallways. I, I'm telling you, I think, I, you know, I, do, I am always a bit reluctant about making big, grand predictions because we actually don't know. You know, we as humans improvise all the time. We, you know, I just saw somebody get out of an, an Uber and, uh, or a Lyft. And, you know, who thought that would be the case seven or eight years ago? Would we all be taking, would we be ride hailing like this? So things are going to change in ways we can't predict. But I agree with you that one of the great concepts in urban planning is something called the desire path. And a desire path is when a planner or an urban designer puts out a park and they say, oh, this is where the walkways will be. And they get it all built and it's all beautiful. And then the park gets used in the first five or six months. They realize that people don't actually want to walk there. They actually want to walk here. I have a park near me with a desire path where people just decide that's the route I want to take. This is a huge exercise in what, a des what our desire paths are for our cities. And so I think there'll be lots of changes. There are gonna be lots of ways. We just have to pay attention to what we actually see happening and we have to let neighborhoods be flexible. And you know, in some neighborhoods, yeah, they might say I want wider sidewalks. In other neighborhoods, they may say I want a 24 seven school or they wanna repurpose public space or they wanna have zoning uh, uh, eased so that they have more flexibility where they might wanna put a manufacturing space in or a co-working space. So I'm all for letting local experimentation happen and for us to really pay attention to how people are improvising. You know, cities are really a big act in improvisation and that's what we're in the midst of right now. Massive global improvisation to make our lives work better. So that leads us to a, one last question here. Could you give us maybe a little bit of a sneak peek into what you're going to be talking about uh, in your keynote during Rising Economy Week? I'm going to be talking about why streets matter. I'm going to be talking about why, why cities are about people and about the intersection between people and place. It matters to us that we have a physical place. And you know, people wanna say, oh, cities are gonna die, they're not gonna be popular. Cities have outlasted every corporation, they outlast governments, they outlast companies. Cities are unbelievably resilient and they adapt and they change and they course correct. And so I'm gonna talk about how we, all of us, whether we're business owners or civic activists or homeowners or renters or tenants or, or we're people that live on the street, that we've all got a vested interest in how main streets are the connective tissue. They're the arteries of the city. And we need to really, this is to me, I think part of the dilemma, I think for COVID is a lot of people feel helpless. You just feel, oh my God, there's so many things going on. The great thing about main streets in your neighborhood is that you're not helpless, you're not powerless. You can vote with your feet in all sorts of ways and to make those neighborhoods and those streets um, uh, have vitality. It's really, I think it's important to our survival and it's extraordinarily important to our resilience. That's what I'm gonna talk about. Tune in. Uh, and we will tune in. We can't wait to hear it. And thank you so much for joining us um, from the streets, live on location. Mary Rowe, have a good night. See you next week. Thanks very much. Bye. Next up, we want to introduce someone who has been pivotal to the work of the Self Island Prosperity Partnership. She is Christina Clark, Corporate Executive Officer with the Songhees Development Corporation, who Douglas Magazine describes as pushing past barriers and finding new ways for Indigenous entrepreneurs to succeed. I would add to that description, uh, championing the Indigenous economy and finding opportunities and points of connection and collaboration. Uh, Christina, welcome. Thank you. Appreciate that, uh, those comments. So Christina, since you headed up the Indigenous Economy Committee of the Rising Economy Task Force, tell us how the pandemic is impacting First Nations communities and Indigenous people and the challenges that are being faced. I think first and foremost is a, a lot of fear. Um, the communities are, are often uh, classified as vulnerable and that there is um, overpopulation and some pre-existing health conditions and other socioeconomic indicators for health. So there is fear in the communities that if, um, if the virus were to get into a community that it could, could really cause widespread harm. So people are being really careful and it caused us to shut down early and, and stay shut down other than basically emergency essential services for our members. So it's pretty, pretty drastic and immediate impact. There are 10 First Nations uh, across the South Island, as we all know, and these nations are, are a diverse group. And so I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how the pandemic is, is making it more difficult to collaborate. So the capacity to, to collaborate with each other, both uh, between the nations and with uh, those uh, across the region. 
And I think that the, the initial challenge is that each of the communities has a, a government and that government has a variety of programs and services that it, they offer to the membership and each have their own um, goals and priorities. And so each, and each nation has a, generally a small staff working really hard to deliver all the programs and services and, and work towards the goals and dreams of the nation. And at the same time, there's a lot of external pressures there's a lot of economic opportunity, but with each opportunity comes the need to engage further. So while the nations are working on some you know, critical services for members, they're at the same time trying to develop um, economic development capacity in order to make more opportunities for members. So it's, it's a lot for each of our governments to undertake and uh, add in a, a pandemic and everybody's working from home. It just multiplies the challenges. Yeah, absolutely. That's, um, it's a huge challenge. And we've got a large and diverse audience watching us here. And so I would like you to tell them, what are your top priorities for building back in a more inclusive way? Top priority is training, skills development. The work world is changing so rapidly. And I, I truly believe, I think we we all believe that the, the way forward is to keep up with the changes. And um, so the micro credentialing programs are really interesting to me um, to get people skilled in, in the specific areas that are needed right now. Um, we need to have more diversification in the types of um, activities that we're involved in. Over-reliance on tourism and hospitality, for example, put us at risk at this time. So we're looking at um, other ways uh, that our nations can be involved in economic development that might have some more resiliency. We're also looking at food, food security and how that ties in with economic development. So there's a lot more interest in programs that have to do with um, um, gardening on larger scales, food production. So that's an economic opportunity, but also makes sense um, if there's concerns about interruption in, in food supply. So, I would say it's, it's many of the same concerns that were raised by the other committees and uh, many of the same solutions, um, just with some of the added complexities that we have when, for example, First Nations are funded um, by programs that are often national or at the very least provincial in scope. And it's sometimes difficult for those programs to get focused into what's happening on a regional level, at a collaborative level regionally. We're kind of stovepiped by the types of programs that are available to us. So that's one of the challenges we're trying to break down is um, break down the silos so that we can we can collaborate indigenous non indigenous businesses without having the, the barriers of um, complex programming. That's that's really good to hear and thanks for sharing that with us. And um, the uh, indigenous economy um, it forms uh, an important part of the rising economy economic recovery strategy for uh, our region, and we are so glad to have you here today. Thank you for sharing with us, and we look forward to collaborating further. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us for our introductory session this morning. You know what? I'm really excited about this week. Yeah. We have brought together some of the leading keynote speakers in the country, plus panels, and we're going to talk about the economy. And you know what I love what Emily said off camera is that the economy really is about people. Yeah, that's right. We often think of the economy as numbers and GDP and all that kind of stuff, but it's uh, it's important to remember in this pandemic that the economy really is about people and our behavior and our, you know, shopping with your with your feet on in local businesses and and uh, only by working together are we going to come back uh, through this uh, pandemic. Exactly. So stay with us. Five days every day. There's lots of exciting content, and we look forward to seeing you there. Please sign into the Whova app for your next session, and we'll see you there.